all over the road. Whee! Or we can do it the hard way and I can release my bipolar. <coughs> and then... You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I've, I've been under the weather lately. Oh, goodness. Oh, I misplaced that file. <coughs> I know you're sick, twisted games, boy. And I heard, like, gurgling, you know. I know I'm into your trouble, aren't I? <laughs> this case is a wild one. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Please do join the quickly growing, incredibly supportive Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Remember, choosing to be kind can save a life in many ways. Thank you so much for choosing to be here with me. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Aaron and all those affected by this case. 50-year-old Aaron Fryer resided with his three daughters, Sierra, Olivia and Ellen or Ellie. They lived in the 500 block of Benson Street in Medford, the largest city of Southern Oregon. Friends and neighbours described him as the type of guy that would do anything for you. If you needed something fixed around your house or your lawn to be mowed or help moving, then Aaron was the man. He was also defined as a very kind father to his three daughters and a wonderful little brother by his older sister Marie who lived in Nevada. Aaron was known for being altruistic and a personable man. He doted upon his three young daughters. Ellie, Aaron's eldest daughter, was a sophomore at South Medford High School in Oregon. According to friends, 15-year-old Ellie was sweet and calm, a bright young student who also played in the school band. The hallways of South Medford High was where Ellie encountered Gavin Curtis McFarlane for the first time. According to Ellie, it was her who initiated the first interaction by messaging Gavin on Facebook. This started off as a friendship that would eventually blossom into a romantic connection. Connection. Gavin was not the most popular kid at school. Gavin was known for his hot temper. At the age of 17, he quit his ADHD medication which exacerbated his violent tendencies. He was under evaluation by his school in order to determine whether he posed a risk to himself or to others. He was voted by his peers to be the person to carry out an event such as Columbine in their school if it were to happen. Gavin was also seen hanging around a middle school school trying to pick up girls according to reports. A source close to Ellie's family reported that until he found out about their strange troubling age gap, Aaron was fine with the couple's relationship. Just to recap, he was 19 and she was 15. He then became vehemently opposed to the two being together, to the point of forbidding Ellie from seeing or talking to Gavin at any cost. According to Gavin, Aaron even went as far as to threaten him with a small firearm. Gavin, at 19 years old, dropped out of the South Medford High School three months before his expected graduation date. This was because Aaron had filed charges regarding statutory intimate violations against him on behalf of his daughter. Gavin's relationship with Ellie had an impact on his social life as well. His friends cut off all ties with him and he became an outcast. He was confronted many times by many people for dating a minor when he was an adult. One of the few people in Gavin's life who was also criticised and somewhat outcast by a lot of people was Ellie. She started to lie to her father about her whereabouts and what she had been doing and she frequently snuck out of the house to go and see Gavin. So we now have an adult that has positioned himself to be with a minor and both have been cut off from the mainstream from their friends. This is the recipe for a real pressure cooker of a situation. One of Gavin's closest remaining friends was Russell Pierce Jones II. He was a 22 year old who was previously twice charged and 
once convicted of crimes of an intimately violating nature involving a minor. That happened in Yamhill County in 2014. He was sentenced to five years of probation as part of a plea deal. Having grown up in foster care, Russell had a difficult upbringing during which he was left homeless and starving at one point. In his own words, Russell owned a protection business. He said he would work with people 20 years old or younger, legally considered a runaway type of age. Russell also stated that the people he worked with were presumably females, people that had had to run away for some reason. I don't know about you, but I get the feeling that Russell was watching too much Sopranos or The Wire or something along those lines. Anyway... Russell's main source of income had been a monthly $735 from disability payments. This was due to his severe autism and bipolar disorder. However, he was unmedicated. As he would no longer benefit from his disability payments if he was to be an employee, Russell would resort to illegal work. However, this had nothing to do with his protection business. Russell claimed he made no money from this venture. Just a quick note from me, is it really a business if he doesn't even receive any money for it? But back to it. Fed up with Father Aaron's pressure and opposition to his daughter's relationship with an adult, Ellie started contemplating fleeing with her boyfriend Gavin. Gavin spoke to Russell about the idea of eloping with Ellie. However, Russell had a better idea. A plan with a more permanent solution. Gavin and Ellie had opposing views on Russell's plan. While Russell thought it was a better plan than just running away, Gavin opposed it. Ellie's numerous attempts to persuade Gavin to Russell's way of thinking were futile. That is, until she decided to fake a pregnancy in a cruel plot to get Gavin to cooperate with her. When Gavin finally succumbed to Ellie and Russell's way of thinking, the trio began to ponder Russell's plan further by scribbling pages and pages of details and diagrams down on paper. Just a note for me quickly, can you imagine these guys sitting around a table in a dimly lit room, imagining they're in Ocean's Eleven or something like that? Can you think of a name for their gang other than Ocean's Eleven? I'd like to hear your thoughts in the comments. Anyway, back to the case again. On the night of October the 1st, 2017, this plan was to be put into action. While Ellie was at a competition for the marching band she was a part of, Gavin and Russell broke into Ellie's home to initiate their plan regarding Aaron. However, they discovered that Father Aaron's girlfriend was present at the home. Their plan was rescheduled for the following night. The next day came, on October the 2nd, the two reappeared at the home. Having found out that Aaron's girlfriend was now absent, they realised that the time had come. Ellie this time was at home. She greeted them at the window and handed over her personal possessions to Gavin. The bags were later to be placed in Aaron's car so they could make their getaway. Ellie then sneaked the two males in through her window. The three of them laid in wait until the perfect moment to carry out their plan arose. Meanwhile, Aaron was busy drinking and laying down on his couch in the living room. As reported by Gavin himself, a conversation about the future and marriage took place as Aaron began to fall asleep. Gavin and Ellie really seemed to have a plan that if they ran away, everything would just be okay. They then realised the time had come when they heard snoring sounds coming from the living room. Russell had brought a large sharp implement as a backup plan, but Ellie suggested using her father's own aluminium baseball bat that he kept by the front door instead. Gavin was sent down to retrieve it. He returned to Ellie's room with empty hands, claiming that there was not a bat in the specified location. Ellie, whilst grumbling that she would be very upset if the bat had in fact been there, went down and retrieved it herself and then and handed it to Gavin. What a strange lover's tiff to have. When Gavin entered the dark corridor, he accidentally kicked a trash can, causing Aaron to suddenly awake. He was confused and asked Ellie what was going on. Ellie responded by saying she was on her way to the bathroom and accidentally kicked the can. Aaron told her to stop scaring him. He then laid back down and closed his eyes. He had already gone back to sleep when the clock struck 2.30am. This signalled to Gavin that it was time to act. With Aaron's own baseball bat in hand, he began striking Aaron who was fast asleep on the couch. 
Aaron came to and was able to shout, asking who was doing this and why. His attempted calls for help were quickly thwarted by Gavin's repeated and continued assaults. Eventually, the house fell silent as Aaron took his last breath at the age of 50 years old. Russell then entered the room and witnessed the horrific scene. He dashed to the bathroom in an attempt to vomit. Maybe his protection business was normally run by having polite conversations, or maybe he was all talk and no trousers. Shortly thereafter, Gavin and Russell wrapped a towel around Aaron's head and a blanket around his body. Ellie, on the other hand, went to get her father's car keys in order to steal his car. Gavin and Russell loaded Aaron into the car. Meanwhile, Ellie returned to the scene to clean everything up with a towel she had grabbed from the house. She then proceeded to steal around $40 from her deceased father's wallet. Shockingly, Ellie's two younger sisters, Sierra and Olivia, were in their bedroom throughout this awful event. Ellie went to say goodbye to them and informed them that she would not be coming back. When asked if they had heard any noise coming from the home, the sisters responded that they had heard a bad word coming out of their father's mouth. After exchanging goodbyes, Ellie grabbed her dog, Sparklebeak, and joined Gavin and Russell in her father's car. A few hours after the incident, police officers arrived at the Fry residence for a welfare check. Neighbours had reported hearing a strange noise coming from the home. When they arrived at the house, they discovered Aaron and his car were missing. They also discovered signs of a disturbance. Russell, Gavin and Ellie drove to a location where Gavin was staying. Then they fled, leaving Aaron and the baseball bat in a dirt embankment on the 9100 block of East Antelope Road. Having a abandoned the car on a side road, the three stopped at Walmart to pick up some makeup and hair dye for Ellie. They then went to the SSI office to authenticate Gavin to collect Russell's disability payments. However, their master plan would soon hit its first bump in the road. A very, very large bump. The troubled trio were approached by a police officer. They were handcuffed and taken straight to the police station. I ain't even know how to beat the legal system with its own laws too. <laughs> Never tricked me, buddy. What are you diagnosed with? Autism, bipolar, definitely don't get me mad. 90% of the time I'm cool. Okay. Unless you give me reason to hit you, then I hit you. Under interview, apart from the obvious motive for the crime, Ellie eventually revealed that her father had physically and verbally maltreated her. According to Ellie, the maltreatment began a few years ago. She said her father was an alcoholic and a violent man who would smash things. She claimed that he called her degrading names and put his hands on her. Here is some of Ellie's interrogation. Alright, how you doing? You are? I'll tell you, if I was at a police department, I would be wide awake. We talk to everybody that is involved, and then... You okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I've been under the weather lately. Oh, goodness. Okay. And then we talk and try to, like, hammer out and figure out what, who's saying what, what's going on, and try to really get the real story from everybody, okay? Do you, is it okay if I keep talking to you kind of about what we've learned? Mm -hmm. Okay, and then if you feel like letting me know stuff, you can do that. Does that sound fair? Yes. Okay. So, this morning when the police were called to your house, it was because your sisters actually saw you and Gavin and somebody else in there, a couple other people in there leaving. Then they saw a lot of blood in the house, okay? So then what they did was call Michelle. You know Michelle? Who's, no, I don't know Michelle. Mm, I'm pretty sure that's her name. Your dad's girlfriend who was over at the house last night? Oh, Mickey. Mickey, thank you. Her name's Mickey. Okay, thanks for helping me out. They called Mickey and then ran to your mom's house, and so everybody is really concerned and worried about you um, and your dad because we actually don't know where your dad is right now. That's really frustrating. That's really, that's really disturbing to hear. I agree. I absolutely agree. And your sisters are a little bit disturbed by that as well. Base, you know, because they, they're they scared that they saw you leaving. They're scared there's a blood in your house and they're scared that nobody knows where your dad is. So they're awfully little to have those kinds of worries. Maybe he was looking for me. So where did all the blood come from in your house? I don't know. Okay. Mickey knows that you were there 
Sierra was there, Olivia was there, your dad was there. So it would be nice if we could get some of this figured out. And like I said, mm -hmm. it would be nice if we could get on the same page now, okay? Excuse me, what's your name? Stephanie. Stephanie, I'm barely awake right now, and I barely have any recollection of what happened yesterday or within the 24 hours. Do you need coffee? I hate coffee. Okay. I try to stay away from caffeine and other chemicals. And you don't eat meat. Is there anything <coughs> we can get you, like, from a fast food restaurant that would... No, thank you. Okay. In all honesty, I don't feel like I deserve that. I don't feel like I deserve any of my basic human rights. Oh. Especially when it comes to my father. Okay, help me understand that. They've shamed me for the way that I eat for years. Okay. Like in what way? Just shaming me. Well, you don't eat meat. Do they comment about that? My dad ridicules me for that. Okay. Well, that doesn't have anything to do with you being hungry and us wanting to go out and grab you something if you want something. No, thank you. Okay. But thank you for the offer. Well, you bet. We are all trying to piece together what happened because we're very worried about your dad. And I get that it doesn't I sound like to you he was father. the best dad. Of course I'm going to be worried about him. He might have abused me for most of my life, but he's still my father. My throat's burning right now. Okay. Well, you're welcome to drink the water, but if it's going to hurt, maybe give it a little break. Mm -hmm. Does that sound okay? Yeah. Anyway, have you met Officer Jackson? He's a school resource officer at South? No. Okay. I haven't. So Officer Jackson says you are a current student there. Mm -hmm. Why would Officer Jackson say that? I don't know. I think because you're a current student there, and you're kind of pulling my leg a little bit. No. And that you're in band. I, I do know about a lot of underage people having marijuana, though. Okay. Well, that's probably a dime a dozen these days. Like I said, it's been a long time since I've seen a parent act the way your mom was acting this morning. She was literally on the ground, sobbing. On her knees with her head buried into the ground, sobbing. She's worried about you. She's worried about Aaron. I'm worried about my dad, too. From what you've said, there's blood at the house and he's gone? Yes. <coughs> I feel like that probably doesn't come as a complete shock to you. I'm very good at hiding my emotions. I have to be strong for my little sisters. Well, yeah. I mean, there's a lot at this point you owe your little sisters. What if your dad can still be helped? And let's find him. Mm -hmm. Are you going to take a little sleep? I'm really tired. Okay. All right. Excuse me? Can I get some nausea medication? Some nausea medication? I don't, you know, there's a garbage can right there, okay? No. I'm going to see. I know we have like Tylenol, Advil. My situation with my father abusing me had gotten worse, so I was looking for a way out. So I started a plan to run away. So I started transporting all of my clothes to Gavin's house. So tell me everything you saw that happened to your dad. I didn't see anything. Mm -hmm. I, like I said, I was in the back room, and when I heard the whole thing going on, I jumped out the window and I ran. Okay. Okay, I'm going to take notes so I can keep track of this, okay? Mm -hmm. How do you know Russell was with your father? Because Gavin was with me, with my stuff. He was with my stuff. How do you know Gavin was with your stuff? Because I could see him through the back window. How do you even know that a machete was involved prior to going out to that North Walmart area? Because he had it on him. And then he pulled it out, and I saw the blood on it, and I realized what had happened. And how were you guys getting around, like to the Walmart or that kind of thing? Russell got the keys and we took my dad's car. And I go in to get the rest of my stuff. Mm -hmm. And Gavin has the car started and Russell has a tarp hanging out of the back seat, mm -hmm. or the back trunk. Yeah. 
and then... Did you stop at Gavin's house first? Yes, we did. Okay. We drop all of my stuff off, and then I was hungry. So what about your dog? We dropped the dog off there. Okay, gotcha. He's there now. Okay, okay. Then I'm going to be blunt with you. The information I have is you knew your dad was in the trunk. My guess is it probably wasn't a great feeling to know that your dad was in the trunk. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What were you saying to um, Mike and Gavin about your dad being in the trunk? I was asking them about it, like, what, what's in the trunk with the tarp? And then, like, a body. And, like, whose body? Why, is my dad in there? Mm -hmm. And Russell says yes. Mm -hmm. I, I believe that Russell's the one that killed my father. Okay. Ellie also describes some other instances in which Aaron would lie down next to her at night and perform acts of self-gratification. Ellie was actually suspended from Medford High School when she was 13 years old for engaging in an intimate act on a school bus. Ellie's claims about her father's non-consensual assault had yet to be proven, but the cause of her reckless intimate behaviour might be explained by her alleged trauma. Sometimes, often, these things can be linked. It should also be noted that this was the only incident she reported with seemingly genuine emotion on her face throughout her entire interrogation. Prior to speaking about this, she would lie about her name and age and she would act nonchalantly. Ellie requested to be tried as an adult, she eventually pled guilty. A year later in January, Ellie was sentenced to 25 years in the Jackson County Juvenile Detention Facility to be transferred to an adult prison at the age of 25. Her sentence was eventually reduced to 20 years in prison for murder conspiracy and five years in prison for first degree aggravated burglary. I would first like to say that I'm sorry for all the pain that I've caused to others through this whole ordeal. Sometimes the hardest part isn't letting go, but allowing yourself to start over. I could focus on the fact that I robbed myself of many experiences. I'll never get to go to prom. I won't be able to watch my little sister grow up and be beautiful and or go to a high school football game as a member of the marching band ever again. I'm not the same scared little girl I was over a year ago. And I've done some growing up with attention. I've seen all different kinds of people and now see humanity from a new, compassionate perspective. We can't erase the past or even change it. We can carry the past on our shoulders and we can start over. With the possibility of the eradication of burglary by good behaviour. So, what about the males? Now on to Gavin. Gavin was cooperative with the police during his interrogation, although he seemingly showed no remorse for what he'd done. He admitted that their initial plan was to chloroform the entire house. This included Ellie's younger sisters, but he stated they gave up on this plan because it was too difficult to buy chloroform online. He also stated that he had been opposed to the plan in the first place, but that he was eventually coerced into it by Ellie. All right, so, um, we've been, me and Jim have been, have spent about four hours with, you probably know him as Mike. Mike took us out to East Antelope and pointed out the tarp, and we've, we have people out there right now recovering Ellie's dad. He's deceased. Ellie's dad was basically wrapped up in a, a, a blanket and a tarp and taken out and dumped. We don't know if this is something that's been planned out a long time ahead or if this was just like last night, you guys decide to go over there and get Ellie the hell out of a bad situation. It's more a matter of why this happened and what was going on through all of you guys' minds at the time. We don't take sides in these kind of cases. We're basically truth seekers. We're here to seek the truth as to what happened. And Ellie has been 100% cooperative with it. Ellie, it's been almost a year now, I'd say. Okay. Boyfriend, girlfriend? It's only about six months. There's some information that Ellie might be pregnant. Has she told you that? Yeah. Okay. You guys are only, what, three, four years apart? Three. A little over three? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Her dad's an alcoholic, and he goes and, like, and he's and she said that he's been her and locked her in the bathroom before and stuff. Has she ever so. told you that anything... Ever regards to that was just recently that's what set me off so okay and then so you mentioned that that kind of set you off upset you mm -hmm. obviously it would upset me too 
And then, so what was the plan going over to Ellie's last night? Was it to pick up her belongings and get her out of that situation? Just to pick her up some stuff and get her out of there, yeah. Okay. Aaron's told, he's helped me get a gunpoint before. He's he what? He started my life and helped me at gunpoint before. Aaron has over at his house? Mm-hmm. And then there was one time he came over banging on my door because he was all mad. I, I actually called you guys for that because I was like, I didn't want to go out the door, look out the window, or see anything because I didn't know if he had a gun or not. But How long ago was that that you called us? I think it was a month ago. Um, gas bubble or something. Okay. Um, I go in the window, RJ waits outside. For he a waits while. outside. Yeah. And then do the bags start getting passed out the window? Yeah. How many bags do you think she has ready and to go at that point when you get there? When we got there, she had four bags. So now it's you and Ellie in the bedroom, and you mentioned that Dad heard you. Did Dad hear you guys in there, or did? Well, he got up, and then Ellie was uh -huh. like, "Oh, I'll just go out and act like I'm going to the bathroom or whatever." Because I mean, I was I didn't want this guy to come in and start beating the crap out of me. So how'd the conversation go between Ellie and her dad at that point when she's saying, I got up and went to go pee? And he's like, all right, well, stop scaring me with all the people trying to break in lately. And I was like, wait, what? Because that was the first night we had gone. I mean, we went over there last night, but, I mean, we, we didn't go for it because um, her dad's girlfriend was there. Okay. Saturday night. So you went over there Saturday night to try to get her out of there. I know I'm in serious trouble, aren't I? And I know this is going to be a little bit difficult to talk about, Gavin, but you've got to be 100% honest and truthful with this. What happens next? So then Ellie got out, and they waited in the car, and then... Ellie went to the car? Yeah. Did she go out the window or the front door? She went out the window. And when you said they waited in the car, are you talking about RJ and her? Mm-hmm. We were trying to wait for him to fall asleep again so okay. that we could get out. Okay. And then he starts to wake up, and I just acted on instinct. And I, I, I don't know what, what I was doing. And then, like, I just kept hitting him until I, until he stopped, and I heard, like, gurgling, and I was like, what, what's going on? And I'm, I'm really sorry. He ultimately pled guilty to murder and conspiracy. He was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole until he had served at least 25 years. Throughout Russell's interrogation, he acted strangely. He repeatedly and embarrassingly attempted to assert his dominance over the authorities. He would even go as far to say, I don't care if you're a fed, I can still twist your little mind. That reminded me of Eric Cartman from South Park. He would also make people big jokes and sing strange songs. Here is some of that interrogation. I'll warn you, it is pretty wild. All charges are to be dropped and every recording due to that is to be destroyed. I know cops are really good at that. Oh, I misplaced that file. <coughs> I know your sick twisted games, boy. Hmm. Two hours. Because I know Gavin has been put in a different holding cell in a different building. Release him. Bring him here without handcuffs. You guys can hold on to the goods. I really don't give a So, we can do this the nice way and we negotiate. Or we can do it the hard way and I can release my bipolar. Which, actually, you don't really want that. Clock's ticking. Gavin, Ellie, there. Or I say no more. Punk. E-I-E-I-O And on the farm he had some bacon With a grease grease there and a grease grease there Everywhere grease grease all over the road Whee! All the way home 
Five little piggies eating at the trough. Wait, no. Wrong one. Three little monkeys jumping on the bed. Um, wait, no. Hey, you guys want to hear another cop joke? Three little pigs fell in the mud. That's a dirty joke. You want to hear a clean joke? You didn't scrub hard enough. <laughs> Russell, digging a hole for himself, said that he didn't act in self-defense, rather that he was defending Ellie and that she was to be released into his custody. Russell's case was delayed after questions about his fitness for trial arose during his interrogation. April Converse says Jones was living with her for about a year before he got arrested. She says the public needs to know Jones is autistic. He didn't even know how to fill out the paperwork to have visitors. You know, he may be 22, but again, with his autism, he has limitations. And I think everyone should know that. When it was determined that he would be tried, Russell pled no contest and was sentenced to 15 years in prison. This was for murder conspiracy and attempted robbery, as reported in August 2021. However, the sentence was changed to a 15-year prison sentence with three years of post-prison supervision. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future, please do let me know down in the comments. Please do hit like if you appreciate what I'm doing here. Thank you to everyone in the Dark Case crew, you too can become a channel member for just 99 pence. A huge thank you to my patrons, your support makes a massive difference. You too can support my work and be thanked in every video for just $5 per month. So thank you to Rachel David, Kathy Green, David James, Addy Alexander, Karen Jones, El Palmieri, James James Harrington, Shane Woodward, Faster River, Stacey Crogerus, Summer Chambers, Mona Corona, Cepheid Variable, Anthony Watson, Jason Coward, Guardian Paler, Jeremy Sebronek, Joy Burton, Dawn Croc, Michelle Mims, and Darlene. Be careful out there, and I'll see you soon.